welcome those again who are joining us online. Welcome. Got your Bible. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 15, verse 11. We're going to read through verse 17. We'll read those and then we'll come back to it. We're talking about love. We're in the middle of a series, love. This, ends, this is the last one. Um, of course, next Sunday culminates our um, celebration of love, 45 years of love, 45 years anniversary as a church. Let me just remind you real quickly before I get into the message that this Wednesday is mega prayer. And I'd like to see everybody be with us on Wednesday here in the chapel. We're going to be praying for our service on Sunday. And I'm asking you to fast with me one meal, just, just exclude one meal, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Not only the breakfast club, but everyone, if you would, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, to fast just one meal, and then pray with me on Wednesday in the chapel mega prayer. How many know that the lifeline of the church is prayer? And Jesus said that some things only come about with prayer and fasting. Fasting is not a matter of physical, but it's a mental thing. And so it's not like we're trying to twist God's arm when we fast, but what we do is we push aside and we say to God, I would rather have you than pizza. I would rather have you than Popeye's chicken. I'd rather have you. Now, I know I'm making you hungry right now, but my point is, you understand what I'm saying. We are denying ourselves, seeking the Lord. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, fasting. Wednesday in the chapel. I would love to see all of you in the front row there. Can I get an amen? Yeah. All right, and if you don't show up, well, anyway, all right. Luke chapter 15 Verse 11, very familiar story. It's a parable. We've heard this many times, and I just want to highlight it today because I believe it is the greatest example prophetically as well as just systematic theology of understanding the heart of the Father when it comes to his love for his people. Luke 15, verse 11 says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and joined to get himself to a, to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed on swine, pigs, pork. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough uh, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Lord, add your blessing to your word. Now, we're going to get into that. Let's just think about that, 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 that series of verses for a while. Let's go back and do a little quick review because this is our last in this series on love. We've talked about what love is. Love in the world, as we know, is defined by culture, education, society, family, religion, experiences, but science or any of these cannot tell us what the real true love of God really is. Love, according to Scripture, according to God's uh, characteristics, his essence, who he is, his love is supernatural. 
And what's so beautiful about the supernatural love of God is that it is eternal and it has no expiration date. Thank God today, our faith has a limit. Our faith has a measure, but God's love for you, God's love for the world, for mankind is limitless and eternal. Not conditional, above and beyond reason and human imagination. Now we've talked about here for uh, through our series about the, how the Bible defines love and in the, the, the Greek language where we get the, inter, the, the translation of the word of God, we, we see a number of words that represent love. And we talked about that, one being eros, which is a sexual love or a passionate love. And then there's uh, the word ludus, which is a, an infatuation uh, or, or flirtation. Uh, then there's a, a fellatio, which is a self-love. And then there's a storge, which is a love between family members and love between uh, uh, relatives. And then, of course, a lot of us experience this, uh, the filio, which is a friendly love. But now we define, and according to the scripture, that the God kind of love comes from the word agape. And this is the love that the Bible says even in John 3:16 for God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life it is a different kind of love than what you and I are used to we are used to love where there are conditions, but in, in, it, with, in regards to God and his love, there is no condition. His love is above all kinds of love, and we see that in the scripture. So the love of God, now as we, we talked about, the love of God, when it comes to you and I, is expressed to God and to the world, because now, remember, there are different kinds of love. There's, there, there's, there's the love that the world tries to recreate. The world tries to, 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 in its own futile way, love the world. And we hear this a lot, oh, I love sports, I love you, I, 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 I love uh, I love food. I love working out. I, I love cars. And, 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 and a lot of times when we say God loves you or I love God, we kind of have already been conditioned in our mind. Oh, of course, I love cars. I love, I love uh, sports. I love this. And so, okay, I love God. No, 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 no. That's your attempt to love God. When we talk about the agape love, when we talk about the God kind of love, it's always a result of obedience to God. Are you listening now? The love of God is not the love of God unless it is expressed in obedience to his will and to his word. And I want to, as we close this series, I want you to get this inside of you, that anything that feels good, yet it is not submissive in obedience to God, is just your attempt or man's attempt to express love, okay? You need, to, you need to get that into your, you, you need to, to understand that because you'll hear it. Oh, I love you. No, unless it is rooted in obedience and submission to the will and the purpose and the word of God, it is just a false sense of love. So what we want as believers today is not just to walk in love, but we want to walk in the God kind of love. Can you say amen today? We want to walk in the God kind of love because the God kind of love doesn't have conditions. The love of God, and we'll see this in a few minutes, the love of God is always expressed in our lives through 
obedience to his word. Let me just give you a case in point. Look at the amplified version of John chapter 14, verse 15. It says, if you really love me, how many love God? All right, come on now. How many love God? We're just gonna do this for about 30 minutes, guys. So how many, so how many love God? Okay, now listen, if you really love me, Jesus says, you will do what? Keep and obey my, my, well, let's, let's, let's read it together. Read it together. If you really love me, you will do what? You will what? Keep and All right. Now, now, so, so somebody, somebody here is Pastor Harvey week after week. Some people may get a little aggravated when he comes up. Because when he comes up, what's he going to talk about? You know why he's coming up. He's coming up to talk about tithing. And offering. Now, if you're obedient and walking in the love of God in that area, you love to see Pastor Harvey come up. He'll, he'll just say, hey, praise the Lord, brother, come on, bring it on. I had somebody meet me in the back and say, oh, Bishop, Bishop, my tithe are going up. I said, that's the best news I've heard all day. <laughs> but you know what that tells me? That tells me that somebody's walking in the love of God in their finance. They're walking in the love of God in their finance. Now remember, anything less than obedience and submission to the will and the purpose of God is your attempt to walk in love. But when we just take God at his word, and we just do what he tells us to do and trust him that he loves you and he wants to see the best for you and you walk in that obedience, guess what? When you obey what he tells you to do, yeah, you're going to have some trying times, but in the end, you will always win. Come on, somebody. I'm going to give you a case in point. Somebody who has hatred in their heart towards anyone is someone who's not walking in the love of God and forgiveness. If you've been married any length of time, you have to learn to master this one. It gets really quiet, okay, you know. When you talk, when you talk about, when you talk about uh, uh, finance and then you talk about forgiveness, it gets quiet. Well, listen, I understand. To you as an individual, it's hard. It's hard to give to God what belongs to him because you're walking in your love. But when you're walking in his love, it's easy to get off of George Washington. It's easy. It's easier to forgive. Why? Because we don't live by suggestions. We live by the commandments of God. So we see that, and I just wanted to clarify that because sometimes that's not made clear enough. But we recognize it in the Old Testament, just reviewing real quickly, that, that agape love, when we see it in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, it really simply means God's loving kindness and his faithful love as, as if he breathes on someone. So we realize that agape, God has no limits. And love is the highest expression of God himself. Ephesians 3, 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted in his love. So he wants us to be rooted in his love. Now let's just talk a little bit about love and, and before we get into the back end here. Just a few thoughts on love. Number one, love has no reason to love. Have you ever heard someone ever tell you, I love you because you sing so well? Or, I, I, well, that's not many of us, but you know, um, we all sing really well in the, in the bathroom. Uh, but I love you because, you know, you give great hugs. Or I love you because you, 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 you complete the honey-do list. Or I love you because of the way you dress. And these are, these are causes, these are conditions. 
But when we talk about the love of God, which again, let me just remind you, God is love. So when someone says, I love you, but it's not rooted in God, don't buy it. Don't buy it. I always tell my, my kids, listen, if, if your boyfriend don't pay tithe, he'll never buy you nice things. Because if you can't give to God what belongs to God, they'll be stingy to you too. When a man is, is, is generous to God, he'll be generous to the people. You can't separate it. I know y'all think you can, but you can't. I'm always checking my son-in-law's tithe record. I don't have to ask, I don't have to ask Allie, that's my daughter, the one who sings and my son-in-law plays the, plays the piano. I don't have to ask Allie if he's treating you good, just go look at the tithe record. If he's tithing, I know he's treating her good. You get what I'm saying? So you say, well, now when you comes to, when you, uh, pass the mic, you got, you got daughters, so this is, how, this is what you do. The checklist is that you meet him at the door and say, son, do you tithe? <laughs> you don't tithe, bye. Because <laughs> it's going to be expensive with my girls. You see, you're going you're gonna to have to. So, but, but here's the thing. The, we, we need to realize that love is rooted in the essence of of God because God is not like love. God is love and love is God. So when we are, we are trying to express the love of God and that's our mission as a church, as an individual, we have made it our mission statement sharing the love of God to the world. We want to make sure that we are expressing the God kind of love and not the other six kinds of love. Because the world needs love, but it needs the God kind of love. Secondly, love has no conditions. You don't need a reason to love people. You don't, you don't, you don't, you say, well, you know, it's easy, even Jesus says things like this. It's easy to love your friends, but he says to love your enemies. I mean, come on. Did he have to put that one in there? Did he have to put that one in there? We can't even sometimes love the people that we go to church with. Let alone the people who don't go to church. See, what I'm trying to get us to understand is, is that when we are baptized in the love of of Jesus Christ, we're not concerned about where a person comes from. We're not worried about the baggage that they bring into the house of the Lord. We're not worried about if they've missed it once, twice, 50, 100 times. The love of God has no condition on what a person has done or hasn't done. The love of God always accepts you where you are. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen today. I'm telling you, I'm loving my own preaching. But listen, love has no expectation. Love has an expectation. Condition is an expectation. Here's what I've learned uh, about, and it's taken me a while, guys, taken me a while. I've learned, I'm learning, and I'm still learning to get better at it. But overall, I've got the thesis, I've got the, the, the message written down, I know what it entails, now I just have to carry it out. I'm learning this in life, do not expect anything from anybody. And this is good wisdom, because many of us live with expectation. And it's false expectation. You are expecting your husband to be something that he doesn't have the capacity to be. Why did you marry him in the first place? You were expecting to change him? Mm -mm. Now, I learned this the hard way many times. Y'all have heard my story. 
Way back when Tammy and I first got married, we didn't get many gifts. We thought we put the most expensive china they had, thinking that people were going to buy us all that china. We didn't give but one or two dishes. We were some ignorant young people. But now we got what we want because the Lord's blessed us. But here's my point. Well, Tammy's father gave us a 25-inch TV, all right? Now, 25 inches is a small TV today, but back 32 years ago, that was a big TV. And especially if you didn't have a TV. And, and, and so we had it. And then one, one Sunday, the Spirit of God was moving. My dad was preaching, and he was preaching on giving. And... And I thought, I don't, I'm working for the church. I'm not making much money. I don't have anything to give. And then the Holy Spirit had the audacity. <laughs> yeah, but you have a TV. And I said, oh, man. And he said, you see that lady over there? He said, I want you to give that lady your TV. Well, we only had one TV, and it came from her dad, and he didn't give us much. But this was something that we cherished. We wanted to worship this thing. <laughs> and so I gave... I talked my wife into giving our brand new TV to this single mom. And we gave her the TV and I had giver's remorse. And man, we gave her the television and I was expecting that man, she was going to love me and Tammy forever. She was never gonna leave the church. She was gonna be an outstanding individual. I mean, we gave her the TV, and she never came back to church. I was so mad. I'm like, how can I give you my TV, and then you leave? And then God had the audacity to put her at a Walgreens, at the cashiers, at the place I would go every week to get things for our house. So every week, I would go to get the items, and there she was checking out. And I wanted to say, where's my TV? <laughs> where's my TV, man? No, she just looked at me like she didn't even know me. And I'm thinking, lady, I gave you my TV. And this is how you treat me? Listen, it's one thing to not say thank you, but then to leave the church. And then when I see you at Walgreens, you can't even put a smile on your face. What was I doing? I was expecting something that was never, ever a part of God's deal of love. That when you love, you love out of obedience with no expectations in return. And if we can get like that, folks, you know what I've learned that's helped me, uh, uh, Dr. Porter? Dr. Pamela Porter, I'm calling you, I'm, I'm prophesying to you. Come, no, just say, you know what I've learned? I have, it's helped me to become offense proof. Because if you live with expectations, now, let me just back up a little bit. Should she have said thank you? Oh, yeah, for her. See? But see, if you give and you're expecting, what will happen to you is you'll become offended even in your good works. It's not love. See, it was, I believe I heard God. I believe I heard God, but I wasn't in the position. I wasn't mature enough to understand what God was not only doing in her, but what he was doing in me. I was more concerned about the external versus what God was doing in me. He was trying to bring me to a place where when he speaks, I'm ready to obey. You know what I'm saying today? I know it's a funny story, and I know you probably, some of you are tired of hearing it, but I'm still hurt about that TV. No. <laughs> but number four, love never disappoints. Learn to obey and give without expecting anything in return. Learn not to expect even a thank you. Boy, it's quiet. 
How many want to walk in love? Don't raise your hand. I'm just asking you for an internal evaluation. How many of us want to walk in love? Learn not to expect even a thank you. And I promise you, you will never ever be offended again. You say, why do we, why do we, why do we, why do we, no, 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 you're not listening. We're talking about the unconditional, eternal, limitless love of God. We're not talking about man's version of love. When the church starts operating in the God kind of love, we're going to see miracles take place. Remember, love is the seedbed for faith. Love is what causes your faith to blossom and to bloom. And if you can't, listen, you remember Paul said, what's the greatest of these? And he said, the greatest of these is love. And some people make that a case that he don't, he don't want us to walk in the gifts anymore. No, no, what he was saying is that the gifts operate out of faith, but it's rooted in love. I prophesy, I encourage you, why? Because I love people and I don't expect anything in return. Walk in love to the degree that you become offense proof. Now you might ask, why are we teaching on love for so long? Well, number one, it's our theme, but there are other more important reasons in this prophetic hour. And as I read to you about bringing the prodigal back to the house, the Lord gave me four reasons why we need to operate in this love because this is a prophetic hour. Now, I want you to hear me because everybody, you know, in America, we have a beautiful country and we, we you know, we tend to see the Bible through America. We, we see the Bible through our uh, 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 American living. But I want you to know there are places in the world where Christians are being persecuted for their faith today. They're not able to go to church when they want to, how they want to, because if they did, it would cost them their life. And so we tend to believe that hard times are coming. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, hard times are already here around the world. But America, 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 this is the prophetic word about love. Why? America is in a crossroads right now where we are seeing a proliferation of the increase of lawlessness. Now, I want you to know that this is a prophetic word today. Why do we need to walk in the love of God? Because lawlessness is increasing. And the only answer to lawlessness is the love and the obedience of God to his will, his purpose, and his word. Are you listening today? Lawlessness is increasing. And when lawlessness increases, the Bible says that people will be offended and even to the point that they are offended that they will walk away from their first love. So if you're not in, 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 and surrounded in the love of God, lawlessness will increase and you will be confronted to the place where you will be challenged do I continue walking in my faith or do I turn around and walk away? And the only people that are going to be able to endure in the hour that is upon us, now I'm not a preacher of gloom and doom, but listen to what I'm saying. The only people that are going to endure and survive and thrive in the coming hours are those who have said, we are going to love like God no matter what's going on in the environment around me. Come on, if you believe that, give God praise today. If you believe that. Secondly, 
the fear that's in the world. Why do we need love? Because perfect love cast out what? Perfect love cast out fear. If you want fear, watch the news. The decisions that we see, the wars, the crime, the death. But the word tells us that the perfect love of God cast out all fear. And you know the reason why people walk in fear is because, listen to me, they're basically, they're not right with God. Because if I am not obedient in an area of my life, I will be afraid. For instance, those who are, now listen to me, I'm, I know I'm, I'm just using this as an example, but just stay with me. For those who are refusing to give to God what belongs to him, what they're saying is that they're afraid that if I pay, I won't have enough. But the person that walks with God says, I know that if I give to God what belongs to him, he will never leave me. He will never sell me out. I'm I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. I'm afraid that if I don't, that something will come against me that I won't have the backing of God because I know I've lived long enough. It ain't if it rains, it's when it rains. It's gonna come against me. I just need to know that I'm on God's side. (laughs) Are you listening? So people are afraid that they will lose out. People are afraid. And so the reason why fear is, is escalating is because they're not walking in the true love of God. Some people are afraid of the unknown, what will happen when I die. You will not let love into that area of your life. So therefore, we don't feel that God is with you. This is why today we need to walk, we need to be baptized in the love of God. Thirdly, the persecution of the church. The persecution of the church is going to increase. It has nothing to do with the Pentecostal church, the Baptist church, the Catholic church, the black church, the white church, the the Presbyterian church, the Methodist church. There's so many churches. Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That is the prophecy of the end time. But more importantly, lastly, why we need the love of God is that the harvest of souls are coming back to the house of God. If you believe that, I want you to give God praise. Come on, give God praise. Now, as we close here, let me just say this. Love is not an emotion. Love is a choice. As a matter of fact, love is a commandment. I'll I'll break it down even. Love is a law. Love is not an emotion. Love is a choice. Love is a commandment. Love is a law. Okay? I'll give you for instance. You're in a 50 miles per hour zone, but you feel like you want to fly and do 80. You can feel it all day long. (laughs) And go ahead and try it. But someday you're going to pay the price. And you're going to be mad when the man or the woman who stops you. And you're going to, you know, you're going to be upset. And they tell you, I was going eight, you know, you were going 80. No, I was going 79. You still broke the law. And this is what we do. 
We think of love as an emotion, as we feel. We've got to stop living by our feelings. And we've got to start living by the commandment and the law. We obey the Lord because he commanded us to love. Let me just read this last, last verse, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to read it from the Passion. It says, love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. Love refuses to be jealous when someone else is blessed. Well, that's a big one. Love does not brag about one's achievements, nor inflates its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as a defeat, for it never gives up. Come on, somebody, give God praise today. I could go through the seven basic needs of humanity, but the fact is love is basically caring for someone else without expectation. Luke 15, verse 17 says that, but when the prodigal came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread? So much that there's a spare. <laughs> that in, in New Orleans terms, that's a to-go box. <laughs> they have so much, they can actually take something home. But he said, as long as I sit here, I will perish with hunger. Now remember, this is not, this is metaphorical, allegorical language. It's a parable. He's using these, these material, tangible elements to tell a story that what he's saying, that, that there's going to come a time in the world, and I believe it's upon us today, that America and the world is going to wake up, and they're going to say, hey, I'm hungry. And he's not hungry for physical food, but there's spiritual food. There's need of a nourishment. And, and they're going to say, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go back to my father's house because over there, they'll accept me as I am and love me with the love of the father's love. Now remember, remember, I read the story. As I leave you with this, this last thought as we, we, we move on to next Sunday and thanking God for what he's done because this is the moment of love. I'm asking everyone here in this room, you're watching this online, real time, later on, whatever it may be, I'm asking you as we read the prodigal story, that we need to get the heart of the Father. Second Peter 1, 3 says, as his divine power has given us all things to pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and by his virtue. I'm asking you, you say, well, Bishop, how do I get the love of God? You need to get to know the Father. You don't need to just come and sit in the house like the elder brother. He thought that by coming and doing the stuff and getting all the blessings here, that that was the ultimate. But the ultimate is not the stuff, it's the people. And the elder brother did not get that. He thought that the inheritance that he had was more important than the, stuff, than, than the people. 
And the heart of the Father is never material things. Does God want to bless you? Yes, he wants to bless you. He wants you to drive up the city church in a Lamborghini. I don't care. He wants you to drive up in a nice truck. He wants you to have the nicest things. But he wants you to know today that more importantly than any of those things, do you love the people as much as you love the stuff? The only way you can get like the Father is to get near to him and begin to live in your inheritance. It's not the, it's the end of the means. When you receive an inheritance, a blessing, it's not the end. So many people get the stuff and they think that's what God wanted to do in their life. No, he gave you the stuff so you could do more. But the only way to get the heart of the Father, you gotta ask yourself this question today. Are you close to the Father? Because if you're near to the Father, you will hurt like the father hurts. You will cry like the father cries. You will love like the father loves. And then secondly, I said it already, love people more than stuff. I have done hundreds of funerals. It's just what a pastor does. We marry. I like those better. We are there when people go through difficult times. I've been there, funerals for babies and older people. I've been there in so many different scenarios. But what I've learned is that no one can take their new house with them. What I've learned is that you can't bring your Gucci shoes with you when you die. You can't even bring your kicks, man. You got to give them to your kids. The only thing, the only thing, and the father knew this, and the brother who was in the church didn't get it because he was satisfied where he already received his inheritance, not knowing that the party was never about how much stuff you can do. The party is always about the one coming home. It's funny, Tammy and I, we're, she went to a, 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 a gala last night for a family member, beautiful thing. And I was asking her who came and who didn't come. She said, oh yeah. I said, what about her? This spurt lady, she said, she didn't come. I said, why didn't she come? She said. She, she, couldn't find, she couldn't find the right dress. And my response was, didn't she know it wasn't about her? The party was about the other person. More importantly than you having the nicest dress at the party is actually, you're there. But see, people are caught up into them. True love is concerned about others because that's how God is. And I'm, I'm screaming, I'm urging, I'm pleading with City Church to be rebaptized in the love of God. I want you to love so much that you will never ever be offended again. I want you to love to where you are offense proof and that you're oozing with the purpose and the will and the word of God in obedience to the love of God of our Father. Come on, stand with me today. Jesus, thank you, Lord.